In this episode of STEMVest podcast, Peter talks with Dr. Steve Brody. Steve has over 20 years experience in research and development, commercialization and open innovation within corporate research and development laboratories, multinational and SME, and university technology transfer offices. He's a creative intrapreneur with a proven ability to recognize innovation opportunities and to create and implement solutions to go after them. A core theme throughout Steve's career has been innovation and, in particular, how individuals and organizations can collaborate to identify innovation opportunities, develop new ideas, and innovate. Currently, Steve is the Executive Manager of Innovation at CSIRO, Australia's premier research organization. ON is Australia's National Science and Technology Accelerator, specializing in assisting researchers from the fields of science and technology, working on projects that have the potential to shape Australia's future. In this interview, we discuss open, collaborative and wicked innovation, classroom-friendly ways to foster innovative thinking, Lady Bird science books, the continuum between school student and a university career as a researcher, problem solving, and much more. This is STEMiverse, podcast episode 17. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dunmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. So here I am in the Stemiverse studio without uh, Marcus this time. So Marcus is flying somewhere over Western Australia at the moment. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us. But I have Steve, Steve Brody with me. And I'm looking forward to a hour filled with a lot of really useful information for our STEM listeners. So hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure. It's been a long time since we last spoke, so I'm sure there's a lot of new interesting facts about all the interesting things that you do. So uh, I'd like you to take a few minutes and uh, introduce yourself to our audience and um, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to where you are now, uh, especially you know, in the context of innovation. So Peter, I um, originally grew up in England and was curious, as most of your um, people are when they come onto your podcast. I'm curious about science. I'm curious about innovation and technology. And growing up, I was the guy that took the radio apart. You've heard that so many times, but it's true. And I studied material science at university in Leeds in the UK and did a PhD in that area looking at how do materials work um, what's interesting about the science and the properties of them. And the interesting thing for me was that that gave me an insight into a whole range of different sciences, from engineering, civil, maths, physics, chemistry. Um, and that really tweaked my interest again in, in how do ideas happen and where does science come from. So my early career was spent as a scientist, working in four different countries in Europe, including France, Switzerland, Denmark, and Spain, of all places. I had a great time there um, learning to be a young scientist and, and driven really by the curiosity of how science works and how it gets applied. So I headed down to Australia and spent some time in my career here as a research scientist with BHP Corporate Research Labs, of all places. And, hmm. The, the big Australian. And again, the, the theme that really got me interested was how do people have ideas that can really have impact in the world, you know, particularly around science and technology. And so in my most recent career, I've been working with university researchers, trying to help them think about where do, where do their research ideas get put to use? You know, how can we look at the world and look at research outputs and then try to figure out how to make impact from those ideas. And that sort of brings me up to my 
my recent role, which is heading up innovation as exec executive manager innovation at CSIRO, um, where all of these wonderful ideas are bubbling up. And again, my interest is around how do we get these good ideas in the first place? But, but equally importantly, how do we help people figure out and how do we empower them to get things done with those ideas? So that's me in a snapshot. Great. Yeah, quite interesting. Um, well, where do we start? Maybe start with your school days. What was school for you? Back in, in England, I suppose, that's where you went through at least most of your schooling, yeah? Can you tell us a bit about what it, it was like? It was, and I was one of these people that came from a very, very small, quaint English, English village. Mm -hmm. And so school for me was a very, very small school, um, maybe about 100 students in the whole school, uh, certainly primary level. But what I recall very vividly one day, and... Um, you know, might be of interest to your listeners as one of these key pivot points where I remember sitting in a class thinking, yeah, I'm interested in some of the things the teacher was telling me, but the, the headmistress at the time noticed I was a bit bored. Hmm. And, and it's a classic story, really, Peter, and, and a lot of your guests would have uh, had a similar one. But the teacher came up to me and handed me a book about atoms. Now, I didn't know anything about atoms. I have no idea. And yet that moment really gelled in my mind of something very, very interesting. And, and yes, it's a bit weird for a primary school. What age were you then? Probably about 10 or 11. Okay. Um, and it just tweaked something. Something sparked in me about this world that we couldn't see, but ultimately was obviously very important. And I think from that day on, I started to get interested in science and um, you know how scientists looked at the world and what was special about that book was it like uh, written like a story or was it like a matter of fact science book oh, can you remember i can and for those of you that I, I, actually i don't know if you had this brand or this um publisher in, in australia but they were called ladybird books mm -hmm. and they were very short very well written books for children about lots and lots of topics, mostly about the world and science and biology and things. But it was so simply written about the story of atoms and molecules and little touch, little touch about chemistry, but, but ultimately it got me wondering about why we couldn't see these things and why we, they were different and how they all fitted together like jigsaw puzzles. And yeah. So that, I think that was what it was. And it was just the elegance of these books. And they were hundreds of Ladybird books that you could get. Yeah. This was one I liked. So you can credit uh, the teacher really for, first of all, seeing, uh, like, I'm sure there were other board kids as well, but <laughs> you were the lucky one that chose them, right? She gave you the book. <laughs> well, funnily enough, yeah, that's absolutely right, Peter. And funnily enough, um, I know... And I can still recall that there was a second friend of mine was given the same book. So we had two copies um, and it clearly didn't affect him the same way. So I think he wanted to try to become a football star, a soccer star. So it, uh, Glenn. Yeah, there, was, there was something about that teacher. And I did go back many, many, many years later when I got my PhD and I went back to, to tell her that, you know, way back there was some inspiration there and she was pleased to hear that. So she set you, essentially, she set you on a path to become a materials scientist. So, yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and what's interesting, actually, is that, you know, coming through my teenage years and later years ready for university, I didn't know I wanted to be a materials scientist, but I did know that I wanted to do something about curiosity-driven science. Hmm. Well, um, maybe let's get to curiosity and talk a little bit about, about that. So that's your experience from school. And then we can fast forward uh, a few decades. I suppose you come to Australia and you now work um, in universities. Uh, you've worked at BHP, a few large companies, CSIRO, uh, where a lot of innovation happens. And you see that innovation happening or taking place in, in the minds of much older people, right? Not 10-year-olds anymore, but uh, much older people. Can you see any, any I suppose, thread that connects a 10-year-old person's curiosity to that of a 
50 year old persons or scientists or engineers? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can. And, you know, when I talk to scientists and researchers in, in my former role in universities, talking to professors, they all have stories about trying to figure things out or observing the world and then kind of asking questions about the world. And, and I think that's what young people do all the time. They, they're asking why. Why did, why did that happen? Why did this work one way or another? And I see that same curiosity coming through in these people that I've been working with. They'll, they look at the world the way everyone looks at the world, and they're starting to see things differently, to pick up on things that others possibly wouldn't see. And that curiosity is still there, and that's there for me, but it's very much there for the, a lot of the people I work with who are innovating. So you, a lot of the people that you work with are thinking like children? Is that a fair comment? <laughs> I, think, I think it's a fair comment, you know. I, I, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a very, very interesting atmosphere when you have, as we do here with CSIRO, we, we, we build, build programs to help innovators and uh, the atmosphere of fun is, is right through these teams and these people. I mean, they're really enjoying this. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's this childish kind of view of the world. Um, I think what's important, Peter, though, is that um, as people are getting older, they're getting more experienced in doing something with that curious, curiosity. You know, so it, observe, observing and being curious is one thing, but then you've got to think about, well, what can you do with it? Um, and I see that happening quite a lot as well. Hmm, very, very interesting. So I suppose at that age, so at the 10-year-old age, uh, curiosity is mostly play, right? And mm. as we grow older, and if we are lucky enough to maintain the curiosity, we, I uh, suppose, put it uh, put some more structure around it, right? So something useful, um, in, in double quotes around the word useful, can come out of it. So do you think that that formalization is the the main distinction between a curiosity of a 10-year-old and a curiosity of a 50-year-old engineer, the structure around the curiosity? I, I do, and I think that um, what you tend to see and what we are promoting quite a lot is starting to ask the question around, and at its most basic level, Peter, in, in industry and in university innovation, it's a question of, who cares or so what? You know, you've got, you've had this observation, you've got this insight, and now you have to start to think about, well, actually, who might care about that? And, you know, in some respects, you could start to say, well, is there somebody out there that has a, a problem or an opportunity to innovate that this insight can address? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later about some of the some of the work I'm doing now with CSIRO around how do we match people with innovation opportunities or problems to solve with people who can innovate and develop solutions. So I think that structure does become quite important, um, but it is that ability to play that drives it as well. Right. So it seems to me like it's connections. So curiosity becomes useful once you start being able through experience, knowledge, and time uh, to create connections between the topic of your curiosity and problems plus solutions. And that, that creates everyday products, I suppose, or solutions that solve life problems. Yes, and I think the other aspect of my work that I've been really fascinated by is for people who have been given a problem to solve, how do they think creatively about new solutions? And I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, be breaking up those thought pathways that are just normally logical, you know, because what we know, and Peter, a lot of your, your listeners know, is that if you're given a problem, your brain on, on paper and actually is pretty lazy. It will try, it will just come up with the most obvious answer. Yeah. Um, and you know the famous quote that the brain is simply a lazy lump of meat. So, <laughs> yes. um, it doesn't really want to do work. So a lot of our students know that. But 
what we can do is we can provide frameworks or systems that help get your thinking off that beaten path. And therefore, it gives you a, a higher percentage chance of coming up with something new. So a lot of my work in the university sector with students has been, how can we develop approaches to problem solving that lead to creative solutions? So it's a bit of an oxymoron, really, but it, it's really what something that gets called structured creativity. Mm-hmm. So it's not just relying on genetics here. You can start to teach and, and give examples and models of how you can give a better chance of being creative. So that's fascinating. Steve, I'd like to ask you about combinatorial creativity because I know that you've done a bit of work in the past. So could you tell us what is combinatorial creativity and a few guidelines and I suppose some um, insight on how a teacher at a school could use it since a lot of our listeners are teachers and uh, perhaps some of your experiments around uh, around that concept. I'd love to do that and I think in following on from my, my previous comments around the fact that in order to think creatively you've got to get your brain thinking off the beaten path. So one of the tools that I've been developing over the years, and I know others have been working in this space, is called combinatorial creativity. And what we simply mean by that is that looking at one idea or one image or a word that isn't related to the problem you're solving can take your mind and let it wander a little bit off in a direction that it wouldn't logically go. So, And when that happens you start to get ideas that, that seem a little bit weird to you, a bit a bit left field. And if you start to focus on those those starts of ideas, you can come back to solutions that you otherwise wouldn't have got to. Now, that was a bit of technical language there, but what we, you know, in practice, what you could do, and this is a really lovely exercise I've done with young children, is to Give the children a little bit of a, um, an innovation problem to have a look at. You know, maybe how could we prevent play about playground bullying? Mm-hmm. Might, um, yep. Or any little topic that they're working on that you think, let's have a go at creating some new solutions. And what we simply do is we ask the children to write down and speak and, and announce some, some of their obvious answers that come to their mind so that in a way we're getting the obvious ideas out. And then we might do something where we pick, say, a random image. And the image could be, let's pick one, um, a giraffe. And what we say to the students is you say, look, what is it about a giraffe that really means that it's a giraffe? What are the essential features of that Im- of that?" animal and they might say oh it's got a long neck or it's got eyes and a head that's high up above the ground or it's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a bit unstable on its legs so you're looking at features not really the giraffe itself but the features not of the a giraffe, giraffe the features yeah. the core essential things it's patchy yeah you know it's, it's got long legs things like that and then what you do from a little practical exercise is you say look let's look at one of those features And let's see if we can't relate that to the problem we're solving and then turn those into solutions. So the example with a giraffe might be, um, look, we've got a head with eyes very high up that's looking around at everything and it's aware of everything going on. Now, this is <laughs> could easily be seen as a logical, logical answer, but what if we had a camera that's centralized in the playground that is always looking around and that the students know is always looking around and that we know that there are people on the other side of the camera having a good close look at what's happening. Security. Security. (laughs) And now, to be fair, I haven't been particularly creative there, but uh, I think the principle is there that you take this feature and, you know, you wouldn't normally link the feature of a long neck of a giraffe to bullying so that has caused you to think off the beaten path but it's interesting because uh, the way you describe it the security of uh, that consists of a camera placed in a high position so you can have a, a good look around the playground 
is, okay, I can see the relation to a giraffe, but let's say that you redo the same experiment and now instead of a giraffe, you've got, a, I don't know, a door handle, the connections that you'd make then would be completely different, right? So that would lead you to perhaps a different path to solve the same problem. Absolutely. And there's a really important point here with this, this approach, Peter, that you don't choose the image to match the problem you're solving. It's random. It li- you might have a, a card deck with 50, 100 images in, and you, you randomly choose one, and then you say to the class, this is what we're going to use. And then you you have to use it. The children can't say, oh, I don't like that image, let's pick another one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to use it. And uh, that's where the power of this, this technique comes in. Yeah, so this is combinatorial creativity. Do you know of any online resources or have you written something online that people can look up and get some information on how to use it in the classroom? Yeah, there, there are, um, there's a, a little toolkit, if you like, called the WAC Pack. It's a set of cards that you can purchase that can help you with inspiration around ideas. It's not exactly combinatorial creative, but it's a similar approach. But realistically, the principle and the technique is very simple. Mm -hmm. You just begin with a whole set of images that prior to the class, you could even ask the students to go and collect three or four random images the week before bring them in on cards and use them directly for this approach. Edward de Bono, who many people would know as the uh, uh, inventor of the the term lateral thinking, he uses an approach like this with random words. So you can even use words. You can pick a page in a book, put your finger randomly on a word, and that word can be used to inspire different thinking. Um, I personally prefer the images, but I think um, random word is pretty good too. Yeah, great. I'm I'm going to include that in the notes of this interview. Um, So that's that's um, a really nice technique. I've also used uh, this the simple version of this in my classes at UTS uh, a long time ago, and uh, yeah, it's very easy. And you can actually do it in 15 minutes. You can have a session in 15 minutes and actually get students in groups and ask them to go through this method on their own in 15 minutes as they're solving a particular problem. And we had lots of problems in that particular class. <laughs> it's a different story, though. I'd like to um, ask you about your time now at UNSW. So you, you have been the uh, Open Innovation Manager at UNSW for a period of five years. Could you tell us a little bit about what your role was there? Yes, yeah, so this was an interesting transition for a university, the a G08 University, one of the leading research universities in Australia. And what the university was really aiming to do was to try to improve the rate at which its research gets used in society. The university is doing an amazing amount of research across a wide range of fields. And as with many, many universities, trying to get the research out of the laboratory and into use Hmm. was something that they were were really interested in promoting. And so my role at UNSW with UNSW Innovations, which is their Technology Transfer and Innovation Office, was really to start to figure out how can we look at research outputs, so the research that's been completed, and really start to look at people outside of the university that might care about it. So a good example would be where you have a a company with a problem to solve, and then it turns out that we might have had some research that could solve it. Mm -hmm. So... Open innovation at its core, the essence of open innovation means trying to figure out whether an idea developed in one organization can add value to another organization. So it's the, technically it's the inflow and outflow of ideas between organizations. Hmm. So my role was to start to bring industry closer to the university to explore those ideas Um, and ideas in this case being research that's been completed. And so we developed some really interesting programs there that um, one of them the we might be I might the audience might find interesting is something called an innovation sand pit. And if you like I can talk a little bit about that. Yes please, yeah. Sounds interesting. So 
Sandpit, as we alluded to before, is about playing. And it's about people playing with ideas. So in the case of an innovation sandpit, what we were doing is we were, we were talking to companies in this case and starting to explore what were the problems that they had that they knew if they could solve would change their business and really radically change it. And we were looking for problems with these organizations that were not easy to solve. And what an innovation sandpit did in practice was to bring a bunch of people together who were, who were smart researchers and a bunch of people from the organization, such as a company, who intimately knew what the problem was and what the innovation they were trying to develop was, and we brought them together. So we might run a half-day or a full-day workshop where we use some of these tools like combinatorial creativity to start to think differently about problems and start to develop some solutions. So we built programs there that um, we'd start to bring in organizations from right across the country, actually. And the term wicked problems was often talked about. But these, are, these are problems that are big and challenging and not easy to solve. Uh, could you give us an example in that space that our university will be interested in? <laughs> um, I could, but I, I can't give you the real detail about it. But here's, a, here's a one that we worked on that is, might be of interest. So the challenge was, how could we as a country build a space agency? And how could we capitalize on all of the cool space-related activities that were happening in our companies, in our universities, and in, in our startup companies around Australia? Mm -hmm. Because we got... We've got the sense that there's a real opportunity there for Australia to really put some of those brilliant minds and ideas to work, but we didn't really know, or we don't really know, how to do that. So we ran an innovation sandpit with a whole bunch of companies, large and small, and by large I mean multinational space agency related organizations, let's leave it at that, yep. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and we brought people together. And so we ran a session, um, down in Canberra, of all places, where we brought all these people together. And we structured creative thinking exercises to explore how could we start to de develop and design a future for Australian space. Uh, and that was done a couple of years ago now. And what is really exciting for me, even though I've now left UNSW, is I'm starting to see um, pockets of news coming up around movement towards developing an Australian space agency. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident that, that some of the people in that room back then would be building this new story around some of the ideas that came up there. <laughs> so you may have triggered something huge and out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so. I, I, well, Peter, it's a, you know, as a, as a facilitator or as yeah. a person bringing something like this together, you play a very, very small part. But, it, but it is, important, right? Isn't that similar to what the teacher did for you back when you were 10? Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. And, and it's a spark. It's yeah. bringing together the right minds and those little tools. And we did use combinatorial creativity. We, we do use a whole range of creative thinking tools and, and a systematic approach to this. So yeah. you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. This is meant to spark that interest and connections as well that otherwise wouldn't have been formed. That's awesome. So, now, so I've got a few other things in mind that I'd like to ask and, and link all that back to what teachers um, in, in the context of STEM should or may be interested in doing in their classes. So the first one is just a point of open innovation. I think you, you talked about your role in, in UNSW innovations, but I want to focus a little bit on what specifically the term open innovation means. So the, the formal definition is the inflow or outflow of ideas between two organizations. So it could be that one organization has developed an invention or an idea that they currently can't make the most value out of, but another organization can do something with it. And in fact, a really classic example of this is where Procter & Gamble, as you know, is a major multinational 
way back in the early 2000s, was not doing so well at new product development. It had some big, big products, but it wasn't doing well at developing the next version of those, or the next generation. And what Procter & Gamble did was they said, well, hang on, we know we have about 6,000 scientists and product development people in, in our company, but what we really also know is that in the same space we work, outside of the company are about 2 million worldwide. And so, correctly, they came to the conclusion that not all the smart people work for us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the next logical step of that thinking was, hang on, maybe people outside our, organ our organization have good ideas too. Mm. So what Procter & Gamble said was, look, why don't we go looking outside for ideas that could be our next range of products? And they actively promoted that and said, look, every year we need to get products on our shelves that have come from, in 50% of the cases, the ideas have come from outside the organization. And believe it or not, they set that as a target. And so coming back to open innovation, what that meant was that they had to have systems to go looking for those ideas. And they had to have systems to be able to tell their partners what problems they were trying to solve. Right. And prior to the world of open innovation, companies were very private about that because they felt that that knowledge was really important that their competitors didn't know about that. Secrets. It's secret. And it's in, in the language it's called not invented here. They wouldn't take ideas that were developed outside of the organization. And many companies failed because of that mindset. Yeah. So do you think that open innovation is particularly suited to the large problems that you were describing earlier, where collaboration is really a necessary part of solving a large problem? Yes. Yeah, so I think that it is important, but it, it's important in actual fact at any level, because mm. what, what we tend to know is that um, another a view of invention, by the way, is that, and, and there are famous quotes here from a theory of inventive problem solving out of Russia that says in 80% of the time uh, or 80% of the cases, technical solutions to problems exist somewhere in the world. You don't need to invent solutions every time, but if you go looking, you'll probably find them. And that's a really important point that if you have a really difficult problem to solve, what you should be doing is having a good look around probably technically in adjacent industries, and you should start to look at how others have solved similar problems. So this works at the big wicked problem scale, but it also works at the you know, small challenging problems around um, everything from science and engineering to biology to maths to, to, to whatever. You, you have to go looking. What's interesting though, Peter, is that there's a shift now even away from open innovation, and I alluded to this earlier, that the shift is now towards what we would call collaborative innovation. So open innovation relies on the fact that I, these ideas already exist, that these potential solutions are there somewhere, and you've simply got to go and find them. Collaborative innovation is really about finding the right partners who, if you work together properly, can create the new solution. So this is where we're seeing the world shifting now in terms of innovation towards this partnering model more so than ever before. So collaboration is at the heart of progress, isn't it? And prosperity. I'm saying that because I was um, I was listening to a conversation between an astrophysicist and uh, a zoologist, <laughs> and there were that, Peter. That sounds like a joke. Is that no, no, it's actually <laughs> true. Uh, so that's the Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, podcast. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you uh, you know that, and uh, a lot of my audience should also know that. So a listener asked the zoologist if she believes that. Uh, monkeys and other primates especially are a lot more peaceful than humans <laughs> and uh, the the answer was perhaps surprising for a lot of people they believe that the, the uh, natural environment is a peaceful place so they actually said that actually you know, primates are very aggressive and uh, very um, warlike that uh, 
species, but in fact, humans are by and large and on the balance are very cooperative species. And that is why we've been able to create a civilization and a technical civilization apart uh, above all. It, it is something that requires a high degree and high, highly developed and organized way to cooperate. But uh, I'm just thinking that going forwards, that aspect of life in our societies uh, has to become even more important, uh, don't you think? Especially as we're becoming more uh, technologically advanced and dependent on technology. I, I, I do think that as well, Peter. And I think now that I, I work with CSIRO now, and we're a national science research organization. So the sort of challenges that we identify that are important to Australia and the world tend to be those big, big challenges, you know, like energy or security or yeah, medicine. water, yeah, food, health. medicine, health. So these are not simple problems that you can just knock over in a, in a, a week or a few months. And so when we look at those problems at scale, which is what we do as an organization, we start to realize that the solutions will have to come from multiple groups coming together, tackling them head on. And almost certainly those groups coming together will be from diverse fields and diverse experiences. Um, because what we can safely say is that the, the obvious attempts at solving the problems have been by single organizations and they've they've not done as well as they could have done for this class of problems. Yeah. So and that in a way aligns up with that idea that you have to think off the beaten path to create solutions in and creativity in your mind. In a way it's similar that a single organization trying to solve a big problem finds it difficult because they, they come at it from one point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to bring together a whole bunch of different organizations uh, and giving them the support and freedom to think differently about some of these these wicked challenges, you know. Um, and we do that systematically. So it's, it's a real privilege to be part of that, actually. Yeah, it's great. Do you think that the school children at school are learning about collaboration? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> in your experience, uh, in your experience back then in, in England, um, you know, I, I experienced it. Mine is very much like that. It's at school and in university, but these days a lesser degree in universities is homework is something that you do on your own. Uh, experience at school is something that involves primarily listening and thinking on your own again. I think uh, our other uh, guests uh, indicate that that is changing as well, and that is very uh, a very good sign of how things are changing and progressing, especially in the context of STEM. So the fact that STEM is so visible in which different disciplines are combined uh, I think uh, is, is a sign that things are changing and uh, schools are becoming more collaborative. But I just wanted to, to ask you, do you think that we should get kids to work on big problems like hunger problem, um, security, health? <laughs> is this, are these problems that we should burden children with? <laughs> yeah, the, the answer could, could easily be no. But I, I suspect that, you know, as children are starting to come through, particularly into high school, they are very, very aware of these problems facing the world. They're very aware of climate change. They're very aware of food and health and people and population. And I, and I suspect that having a look at that objectively and having a look at it in a classroom and trying to work out how might they start to tackle some of these problems could open up their, their minds a bit and open up their minds to to who else is tackling them? You know, what does CSIRO do and CSIRO do? What are, what's the UN doing about water? And it could well be that that's a bit of a spark there. Or what themselves could do. I'm thinking a collaborative innovation approach uh, in fostering or awakening or teaching, in a way, innovation uh, mm -hmm. uh, for kids at a very young age. 
Do you think that might work? Collaborative innovation at, say, high school? I do, and I think that, that those tools that help bring people together and really start to look at systematizing creative thinking and problem solving are really valuable. And also how you do that as a team in a team environment. Yeah. And I think the sooner we learn that, the better. And, I, and of course, that, that addresses this issue that we hear about time and time again. And we've heard Ken Robinson talk about it. And this idea that students are coming through and somehow losing that confidence to be creative or confidence to challenge or question or be curious. Um, and I think that this approach and the approach of looking at innovation problem solving systematically, I think can give students the tools that they can use for the rest of their lives and give them back their confidence to be to be willing to have a go. So I, I would I would encourage teachers and, and to have a go and to to look up some of these tools and really just play with it. And I myself have, have run programs um, in in a past life on combinatorial creativity with students, and we did this. The example was around storytelling. Actually, mm -hmm. how could you use combinatorial creativity to inspire a new story that that the students could then go on to write. So funnily enough, we brought images from with different aspects of the story, maybe random images for random characters, random plots, random locations, and we simply dealt the cards to the students and said, right, here are the random story, random elements of the story, let's create the story. And what was really interesting and exciting, Peter, was that those students that believed that they were not able to write stories, they convinced themselves that they were no good at this, yep. really got into this for hours, for literally <laughs> two hours, creating story after story after story. Um, and the formal feedback from the teacher was outstanding. They, they were... They couldn't believe that the good students did really well, but the students that felt they were not good actually did really, really well. And, and I read some of these stories and I was blown away. So it was the system, right? If you believe it was the system that really released those creative juices and it gave them infrastructure to uh, externalize what was already inside of them. I think so. And it gave them in a, in a fun way, actually, that... You know, you could randomly select a, a fairy godmother or you could randomly select a big bad wolf. <laughs> wolf. Hmm. Yes. And then you might couple that with a penguin that's randomly selected. Hmm. And then a really weird location. You could have been, you could be on Mars. It's just random. And then you have to weave this wonderful story about those characters and the plot on There's Mars. There's no limits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there really were no limits. And I... You know, the stories were fascinating. And of course, some were better storytellers than others, but they all had a go and they all came up with stories. I read probably 25, 30 stories that day and it was it was amazing. Well, well, that's, that's definitely worth trying. And it's just really, we're talking about very basic resources here, just pen and paper, really. And, yes. Uh, some basic instruction on what to do. I'm just thinking now that let a today's 10-year-old student will be a researcher at UNSW or some other leading university in 20 years from now. What do you think that, say, the two or three very important characteristics or skills of the 30-year-old researcher, which who is 10, year old, 10 years old today, might be? That's a really nice question. And I think, you know, it's so hard to see what the world would look like in mm. 20 years' time. <laughs> However, what we really know, though, is that this, I, this ability to have a look at the world and start to see where you can apply your creativity, where you can apply and put your brain best to use is going to be critical. It's that yeah. observational side of the world or observational side of a person um, and that really boils down to engaging with people. So I think mm -hmm. your ability to, to work with people to figure out what are they doing and what is it that they're trying to do, 
that you can help with. So, you know, we, we, it, we use this language of value proposition sometimes, um, and it's in the startup world. It's, it's about getting to the bottom of what's, what's the job these partners are trying to do and how can we help? But I think the other key lesson here is that creative problem solving. You know, how can you put your mind to use to come up with something different that is valuable to the people you're working with? Um, you know, because we know that robots are coming. We know that Internet of Things is coming. You know, we know a whole heap of things around where the world's heading. So the differentiator, I think, to be successful will be some of those things around engaging to identify the opportunities to innovate, but also being able to think creatively about mm-hmm. it. And of course, Peter, the, the, the obvious final part of that story is being able to bring the resources together to actually go and do something about it. Right. So, you know, to be practical and get things done is, is going to be a big part of the future of, of uh, creativity and innovation, of course. Well, that's, I think that's a bit a big part of what STEM is trying to do as well. So the, the emphasis there is, uh, I think, is, is great news. So I also wanted to mention, uh, as you said, we don't know what things are going to be like in 20 years from now. And just yesterday I read about the uh, latest experiment coming out of uh, China, Chinese research uh, where they are trying to build what's called a quantum internet. <laughs> I don't want to get into details uh, because I don't know any, but <laughs> the internet in 20 years from now is going to be totally different to what it is today, even for people that are in the industry. So it's just, it's mind boggling. So just uh, mindful of the time, Steve, I'd like to ask you a, a few uh, quick questions. And for example, I'm really interested to know who has been a great influence uh, in the in the way that you think, the way that you work, and it could be a living or not living person, like historical, modern. Um, who who has been really a, an influencer for you? Yeah, so one of the people that I have been really inspired by in the past, and unfortunately this guy is not around anymore, is a is a physicist called Richard Feynman. Yep, and. Uh, Richard Feynman was an uh, American physicist um, who really showcased this idea that it was okay to be curious. And that yes. it, was, it was really okay and valuable to have fun and to play with ideas and to explore different aspects of science. So he, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. But what really I think he's famous for is looking at the world and then starting to look at it through you would call different eyes, but just taking notice of things. And there are some wonderful stories online that you can you can look up around. You know, example would be how he looked at a flower. So that's one that you I really recommend you go and Google because he started to look at it with a different mind, not just from the phys- physicist point of view or a scientist point of view or a but from a, an artist's point of view. Mm. Um, and in fact, you know, he's got some wonderful stories about his time in the Los Alamos labs in the US and, and the fun he had there. So he, Where they were building the atomic bomb. Absolutely. Yeah. He, was part, he was part of that team. Man- Manhattan Project, yes. That's right. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, th- I think actually it's one of, it's one of my favourite books, actually. Great. It's, um, Surely you're joking, Mr. Fine. Yes, yes. No, he's definitely a, a quirky uh, physicist and scientist, and his his recorded lectures are also famous. Uh, you can just watch them instead of a, a movie or a series. Uh, very entertaining, even if you don't understand what he's talking about. <laughs> it's just he's so animated, and like a teacher, I think he is one of the ideal teachers. Absolutely. And I think the thing that I enjoyed the very most about about Richard Feynman and what he was doing was his ability to simplify and communicate difficult, complex problems. And you're, you're absolutely right. The, the Feynman lectures in physics are the absolute core essential reading for people studying physics. But the beauty of that, it was the clarity and yeah. his ability yeah. to get difficult concepts across. Yeah, um, and I, that's inspired me, and and a lot of what I do now is 
is about you know, clarity of communicating difficult concepts. Yeah, oh, thanks for that, uh, Stephen. He is one of my inspirations as well. I need to go back and pick one of his books out of my library because I really need to reinforce all that. So I'll yeah. do it right away. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my last question would be, um, what advice would you give to educators just starting out now? Remember 10-year-old kids? So these are the educators that will educate the next generation of scientists or problem solvers. Yeah, a simple a simple answer may well be just give them a book about atoms. <laughs> that, would hit, that would hit everybody's uh, peak interest. But I, I think the ability to give students time to think and reflect and be curious and give them the freedom to do that is is really mm-hmm. important here because they don't know what where they're heading either. They don't know that they may well become a material scientist, but they you can pique their interest by giving them exposure to a whole wide range of different views of the world and different uh, elements of science and STEM that are popping up around the place. And then I think it's important that you actively watch carefully and, and pick up on those clues that are coming back on what is interesting them and what really drives them to want to do and explore further. So yeah, that would be my advice. I, I am absolutely sure that almost all of your listeners would be doing that. But yeah. I think that this ability to give people time to think is, is becoming more and more important in this really rat race society. You know, we, we are constantly busy. And we also do that in our organisation. We give people permission to think. And it's, uh, That's so important. Slow down. That, uh, I'll take that. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> and also, and, and this is for the, the, your audience that are not 10 years old, give yourself permission. It's okay to have an hour just to think. Go to the cinema. Go to a, have an experience that's not your normal one. Go for a walk. And that will go for a walk. And, and that, by the way, is where you get your brain off, off the beaten path. So go for a walk. Um, I once had a look at some of the work that people had asked people in the Fortune 500 companies where they got the idea from for the company. So this is old research, but, you know, there's 500 of the world's top companies. It turns out that in 1% of the cases, so five of those companies, the original idea came from people when they were on their honeymoon. (laughs) (laughs) Just the... relaxed (laughs) relaxed <laughs> of course the point is exactly that they're relaxed they're not thinking about work necessarily and their brain is thinking off the beaten path yeah they're getting inspiration from taking a walk or a sunset or whatever but that's the key here sometimes to create it. Yeah, that's true that's good advice and uh, if you did take a walk just try a different path each time don't take the same path every single time because you'd be getting the same connections made in your mind so that's uh yeah you've got to try something else off the beaten path path as they say so steve uh, we are out of time and uh just uh before we finish i'd like to ask you if you're on social media uh if somebody would like to follow you and your thinking in everything that we discussed uh, what's the best way for them to do so yeah absolutely i'm on social media and my Twitter handle is at Inventor Steve. Awesome. I'm looking forward to socializing and getting to know that. I, I do get your tweets, uh, they're pretty quirky sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate your time. And I uh, will talk again soon. Rex, absolutely welcome. Thanks very much for the opportunity. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.